Hello Internet, this is Brian Holland. In my last video I talked about context and how I used it to flavor the rolls I made on my monster generator. Today I'll use everything I know about my setting and story thus far to design the crypt that Isolith the Wizard entered during solo play. Step 1 is to make a modular map that can be placed in any setting or story. Step 2 will be using Sly Flourish's Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master to prep the crypt for my setting and story. If you want to see how I build the flooded crypt, please stick around. First, I want to say that maps aren't really necessary in Dungeon World, or any game really, where you're going to play Theater of the Mind. Even when you do, the game's first principle is, draw maps, leave blanks, so you don't really need a full map. But the game also tells you to exploit your prep. I like to have a map prepared so that I know what's around the corner. Even when the players don't see a map, I like to have one for reference. So, the first thing I want to do is review my context. I know two things from my dungeon roll. The crypt is a natural cave, and it's mostly submerged. Now, I can draw about as well as I did in the second grade, and maybe not even that well, so I'm going to go online and find a map that fits that context. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Dyson Logos. He's an amazing artist whose cartography has been featured in some of the recent D&D 5e adventures. Let's go to his website, I'll link it in the description below, and I'm going to look for his commercial maps. Dyson has a library of maps he's created that he offers for free with a commercial license, and that's really incredibly generous. His commercial license reads, These maps are free for personal and or commercial use. They are released under a free, royalty-free commercial license. This allows them to be used, reused, modified, remixed, mangled, and published for personal or commercial use. To make use of this license, you are required to credit the map or cartography to Dyson Logos. And of course, I'll do that when I publish my altered map. I looked for a map I remember seeing a couple weeks ago that looks natural and has some verticality. Once I found it, I saved it to my desktop so I could start working on it. I'm not super proficient with image manipulation programs, but I've spent some time with GIMP, which is free, and I can do some pretty basic things with it. I did some basic color manipulation on Dyson's map in Paint to make transparency easier, then I added a texture called Scab Stone 3 by Mark A. Thomas to give the walls a stone look. After some more transparency, I filled in some color to make three distinct water levels on the map. Dry, ankle deep, and submerged. Once I have that complete, I can start designing the crypt. I'll use some of the context from my solo play session, specifically that the entrance is covered in vines. I'll make that a feature of the entire crypt and use it as a base for a dungeon move. Let's call it Entangle Them. The ceilings are probably about uh, 5 to 10 feet high, varying heights. I'd say there's no light in the crypt, and the sounds of dripping water and lapping water can be heard throughout the non-submerged parts of the crypt. I'll make a generic move that might be triggered by these features and call it Notice Them. Echoes would be a thing in a cave like this, and I think I'll add another move called Confuse Them. I imagine the smells of mildew and rotten vines here as well. Now I'll make a custom move for areas that are completely submerged, and I'll call it Hold Your Breath. This is a player-facing move that reads, When you attempt to do something underwater, you must first roll plus con. On 10 plus, you have no problem holding your breath and may continue. On 7 to 9, holding your breath hurts, but you may continue. Take a cumulative minus one ongoing to hold your breath. Remember that as the GM, I get to say whatever I want when the players roll a 6 minus. Now I'll add a couple monsters that live here. Ropers, which I'll just pull right out of the Dungeon World rulebook, and water snakes, which I'll design with entries from my monster generator. I'll add generic names for the map itself and each chamber, and the basic map is done. This is a dark crypt cave with some interesting features and a couple monsters. Add to it whatever you need to make it fit your setting and story. I've linked the map in the description below, along with a blank copy to help you customize it. Now, anyone more proficient with GIMP than I am would have done this much faster. It took me about 30 minutes to turn this map into this map. Okay, before I show you how to prep the map for my story with Isolith, I've included this blank map and I want to show you how to customize it for your own game. Let's say in your game, your players are on a quest to find a wizard's spellbook. Simple thing. To do that, they're gonna have to go into his lab. So let's call this a wizard's lab. 
And why might a wizard's lab be flooded? Well, I'd say he conjured a water elemental. And something else that's probably in a wizard's lab would be a quasit. Quasit is similar to an imp. It, uh, it has an instinct to, to follow orders, to serve. So let's start looking at these rooms. Uh, this can still be the entrance. But I think, rather than having vines covering the entrance, I think this has illusory walls covering the entrance. They look solid, but they're not. You gotta find how to get through there. We can come on into the crossroads. I'm gonna call it the same thing. And I'd say maybe this wall this chamber has illusory walls as well. You come in, you dip into this water area, and this looks like the end of the cave. These walls are illusory. That prevents people from getting to his study. I'd say his books, his equipment, things like that are gonna be here in the study. And when you go to prep this, probably almost everything in there is ruined by the water. The storage room is here. Again, protected by these illusory walls. He's gonna have his food stocks, his uh, spell components, things like that in here. Again, most of these will be ruined. Let's add a door right here. And this can be his bed chamber. Anything found in here might be a little damp, but not ruined. He's at the highest point of the cave in this chamber and you know the water has not gotten up there so here things are not going to be so ruined these stairs we might want to do something with maybe maybe the closet is hanging out there i don't know whatever you want to do with that uh, if you were to prep this uh, use your imagination finally this room here was his conjuring chamber That's where he conjured the elemental that ended up flooding the cave. So there I took a little bit of context. This is a wizard's lab and I was able to rename all of these rooms, find a couple monsters that go in there. Let's look at our features now. It's probably going to have the same smell of mildew. And maybe something the wizard doing is doing uh, is causing smoke. Or maybe something the wizard did cause some smoke. So there's those two smells in there. I don't think there's a move associated with either of them. This cave might be a little unstable, so there's some rumbling. And that's probably causing stones to fall. You can make a move for that, you know, that might hit someone and knock them out. When those stones fall, they cause water to splash. Probably no move associated there either. Something else this room has, or this uh, cave has, illusory walls. That might confuse them. If they can't, you know, find where they have to go. There's no way through this, this initial chamber because of the illusory walls. That's if they get through this illusory wall here. Maybe they figured it out by the time they get here and will know what to do. Maybe it's not illusory walls. If you remember from the sixth Harry Potter book, you know, you had to make an offering at these walls for them to open. Maybe you have to put your blood on it, which will weaken you, and that will open these walls up. Use your imagination there. What's well, one more site we might think of for this wizard's lab? Maybe, maybe he's got an astrolabe. That would be cool. Maybe it has a move, maybe it doesn't. I won't put one here when you prep. If you want to do something cool with an astrolabe, you know, maybe put that in the bedchamber and find a cool move for that. 
So there it is, real quick and easy. I took a little bit of context that this is a wizard's lab. I was able to rename all the rooms, put a couple monsters in it, find some cool features, and that's really how you can use this blank map. Use your imagination, use your context, your setting and story, and make a new cave from this map. All right, next we're gonna go and look at how I prepped my original map for Isla's story. All right, now I'm gonna demonstrate how I use Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master by Michael Shea to prep the Flooded Crypt for my solo game. This book changed how I prep, how I think about prep. I think it's essential for anyone who runs games, be they a GM, DM, Keeper, or whatever your game calls it. it uses eight simple steps to quickly prepare a role-playing session. The author regularly streams live prep videos that last about an hour long. I've linked to it in the description below. Now let's get started on my crypt. Now, I'm going to include a bonus PDF in the drive-thru RPG download of this map with everything I discuss here. In Sly Flourish's method, you start by reviewing your characters. I only have one, Isolith, but I must review everything that's happened thus far. That includes the story, locations, NPCs, everything that has already happened. That's my context. Next, you think of a strong start. The last thing that Isolith did in the previous session was walk backwards into the cave to bypass the sprite's trick magical lock. I think I'll start the session with him struggling against vines to make it through the first chamber. That'll probably be Defy Danger with Strength. Next, outline your potential scenes. This is not where you decide what scenes will happen, only scenes that might happen based on everything that's come before. One scene I'd like to see is a flashback with Elsie the Tinker and Simon the Ghost. If you'll remember from my solo play session, and I've linked it in the upper right corner here with a card, I skipped ahead narratively when I met Simon because I wanted to get to the cave because I was about halfway through my session. This scene can clue Isleth into some of the things going on in the crypt. Another scene that's possible is if Isleth goes down into the submerged part of the cave and drowns. I don't want the story to end here, so I'll have Simon the Ghost follow him down and rescue him from drowning if that happens. In the solo play session, Simon said he couldn't re-enter the crypt, but I can say that he saw Isolith enter and figured out how to do it himself. Finally, I know I'll have a climax scene with Isolith and the sprite. The fourth step is defining secrets and clues. The author feels this is second in importance behind reviewing your characters, and I agree. The clues I have can inform Isolith of the water levels, the fact that there's a royal treasury, um, the fact that if he disturbs that royal treasury, the spirits probably won't take too kindly to him. The treasury has a metal gate, but it's almost completely rusted through, so it'll be easy to open. Simon's spirit was awakened because when the sprite's magical lock went into effect, it disturbed the water levels and knocked over a statue that was important to him. If Isolith can put it back in its proper place, Simon's spirit can rest again. Any or all of this can be explained by Elsie or Simon during a flashback. And if so, I'll probably let the Oracle decide what they tell him. I can use some of this information when Isolith uses spout lore or discern realities as well. Next, we develop fantastic locations. For this crypt, I won't do exactly what the book says because I already have my cave locations. I just want to rename them specifically for my Royal Gnomish Crypt, make a few short notes about what's in each chamber. The sixth step is outlining important NPCs. Simon the Ghost definitely needs a little fleshing out, no pun intended. I can also work on Elsie, and I haven't done anything with my sprite yet, so I'll do that now. Again, I'll use all of my context to do this. Next, choose relevant monsters. I've already done this when I created the basic crypt, the ropers and water snakes, so for now, I'm just going to make sure I have their stats ready for play. Finally, you select magic item rewards. I'll write these as if-then statements. If Isleth puts Simon's spirit to rest, then he will be rewarded with a specific item. If Isleth takes something from the royal treasury, then it will be a cursed item. And of course, Isleth's quest is to recover the clockwork control crystal from the sprite so he can fix or replace his magical ruby. If he returns the control crystal to Elsie, then a new magic ruby will be his reward. So that's it. I've created a basic cave, showed you how to customize it, and showed you how I prep it using Sly Flourish's Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. 
You'll find a drive through RPG link in the description below for my map and for his book. I don't plan to monetize this channel, so any purchases from drive through RPG would be much appreciated. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. If you like my content, please subscribe and share my channel with like-minded friends. Thanks for watching and have a great day.